So um, flow acoustics has a couple of modes of operation here. First, uh, the flow is you know like a typical tick of a fan or something. Um, it, 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 it can excite the structure. The, fan, the noise can come out directly, or it can excite the structure into a vibration, and, and you wind up with radiated sound. Or you can, uh, and, and so you have the different different paths. So just the fact that the structure is there can give you sound, and then so forth. So that's the, kind of the impetus for my the group that, that we we were involved with. We have quite a group. We have several. They're they're both computational and experimental. We have uh, and I, this is kind of. I've kind of classified uh, the people by how I think that their, their skills are, but you can see there's quite a few, a mixture of ARL people, um, the College of um, Aerospace Engineering, uh, and also in uh, Mechanical Engineering, as, as well as Acoustics Department as well. So these are kind of the people and the kind of their skills that, 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 the, that they have. So I'm going to go through... Um, three topics, myself, and then uh, Dr. Crane will talk about uh, the final topic. So um, the first two topics are kind of uh, similar to each other. Um, they involve uh, NASA is trying to make um, airplanes uh, that are very slender wings that have laminar flow over a majority of the wing so that they can inc improve efficiency. And as you can imagine, a long slender wing is gonna have a lot of vibration issues and, and uh, potential acoustic issues associated with having such a, such a wing. So um, the, uh, the a typical wing, in particular, because it's so long, there, there is going to be a, a strut supported uh, part on, the, on the, the side to hold it up to, to hold the wing up. So that's just that long. So they're going to make the cord length so they keep the flow as laminar as possible. Um, so, um, and, and it turns out in order to make the wing work, it it's actually comes into two parts. There's a fore element and an aft element. And so we have to deal with the aerodynamics on both elements and then the relative motion between the two. In particular, we're interested in the flow and the gap between the two. And I'll show you a little bit of picture of what that gap looks like. And we want to make sure that that gap doesn't open and close because it's very sensitive for, for shocks and so forth to deal with. So it's something that has to be looked at for that for that aspect as well. So that's the kind of thing. So one, there's two aspects to this. We have to deal with the aerodynamic part of it and also the structural part and how they marry together. So this is kind of aeroelasticity in, in, its, in, its, in, in its definition. So we need to deal with both of them. So we're, we're building up this, the student we have is building up the, the expertise in order to do both, both of these uh, things. And right now, uh, this is the aerodynamic part. So we need to account for uh, the, usually it's just one wing. We have to deal with two of them in order to be able to figure out that characteristic. And then we have to extend that out for the whole length of the wing in order to come up with what's going on with the vibration of that particular case. So we're trying different degrees of sophistication with going through that. So we, we work through, through all the way through maybe some experimental data we can use and then also uh, some, some CFD for that as well. Um, so uh, one particular thing is we have to have a connector. The connector between the fore element and the aft element is a very integral part because we don't any kind of, you know, the laminar flow uh, wants to be as continuous as possible and not have any, any disturbances. So it comes down to optimizing the shape of the connector. And these connectors are in finite locations, let's say eight of them along the span, or how many ever you want. So, Right now, in the structural part, we built a, a picture of the structure and with uh, the wings, and we're looking at how we were going to do that. In particular, we wanted to do the wings as two separate parts, a four element and an aft element, and bring them together with component mode synthesis in order to change out these connectors without having to reanalyze the whole wing. It's been around for a while. The students are coming up to speed to doing that, and I want to just show you how we do that. So the way you do that is you apply unit loads, at locations of connectors, extract the normal modes for each wing separately, and then use uh, re residual uh, modes to, to come up with the fact that now you have some, some discontinuities where they're attached. And then the, the coupling of the two wings is done by component mode synthesis. And that's us. So I want to show just a slide on how we're doing on comparing the two. So here's the case on the one is the finite element. And on right was is done in in, in, uh, in MATLAB to show that the agreement's been going pretty. So we're, we're in pretty good shape on the structure part, and we'll have about a year or so to integrate the aerodynamic part as well. Okay, 
So the next topic I want to talk about is the sound that's generated by these long wings. Um, there's, a ver there's, a, there's a variety of different uh, phenomena associated with it. This work is being done by Ken Brentner and also with Ryan McConnell. So if you look at an airplane, you have a variety of different uh, uh, aerodynamic sources that could happen. Landing gear, the flap and flap side edge noise, trailing edge noise, fan noise, and jet noise, and any kind of combustion noise. So everybody probably thinks it's mainly the fan that's making the noise, but that's not, especially coming in for approach. Uh, you know, that they cut, they cut down the amount of noise from the engines themselves and you wind up a lot of airframe noise too. So all these have to be accounted for. So the, uh, uh, Ken Bretner's had a routine called ANOP that's been predicting this for, for, the, for airplanes for several years. And I just want to give you a quick summary of how it's working out for these long slender wings. So we did, the, he did a whole bunch of different profiles. I'm just showing you a couple. Uh, here's one, uh, this, this curve on top shows the profile, so a lot of times they want to get up and get out of the way as quickly as possible to cut down on the environmental noise. So that's the typical uh, flight path that you would have uh, going up and down, depending on whether you want to do takeoff or, or, or landing. And then also we can see on the other side what the speed is, so the speed increases as well during takeoff, and that's shown in those particular curves. So what's a nice thing that, that um, Dr. Brentner is able to do is be able to you know, deal with the fact that, that going through and look at how that does that profile change as a function of how, 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 the, how it's going through the track. So here's an example of a typical 737-800 demo uh, that was doing the case. And you can see a lot of red in this area um, on the top. In, the, in this particular area, there's a lot of red right where it's taken off. And you can see it's it forget and then it, as it, it goes up, the amount of level drops off as a, as a function of how far you are downstream. What's that? Okay, as, as far as how, how far you are downstream. Now, if we, go, if we go to the next slide, we can see that the, with this long slender wing, we have a lot less red in here, so the levels are a lot lower and you're able to get a, a better profile. So there's some advantages for noise with going for this kind of airplane as well. So that's a key point. All right, so this is kind of a summary of what, what they found. Um, the fan noise is, in this particular case, the largest contributor because you're trying to get up to elevation. Noise from the aft animals becomes more, very significant. And the flap noise is just below the fan noise for the vision, uh, for this vision vehicle that we're talking about. And then downstream, it comes down to the airframe noise winds up being very dominant, and uh, the flap noise uh, becomes the largest contributor, and then the noise from the aft element uh, is also coming in there. So that's something that, that's being looked at in this integrated thing. So this is a university-led uh, initiative that we're looking at this particular wing. It's ran by uh, yeah, the overall uh, university is University of uh, Tennessee. Okay, the last one I want to talk about, um, and then I'll let Mike talk, is we had a practical problem here of being able to do some uh, noise surveys to see what we were going to do about um, building uh, a structure put next to a building. So in this particular case, this, this is a, a building that the university owns. It's over there and where we have a, a building that's in this bottom, bottom right here. And they wanted to put a helium recovery system in here. The helium recovery system is needed because helium is getting very expensive and they do a lot of welding with this stuff or manufacturing with it and they want to recover the helium. So it's brought in there and there's large compressors that are used to compress the gas uh, back into helium so they can reuse it again. And the question was, um, is this going to exceed the noise requirement at the boundary? So if you could look along the estimated property line is where the uh, where, where they, we have to do it. And it has to be less than 55 dB A weighted at, um, at, uh, after 7 o'clock at night. Now, most of the time we run during the day, but uh, there's a possibility of that. So it came down to being able to figure out what was going on here. So first thing we did was we went through that environment to see in those buildings what is that level. So we first we did a, a range of different, different cases as shown on the left, and then to show you that really spherical spreading works pretty well, these are all collapsed based on R squared uh, decay, and we wind up a very, very good collapse curve. So that we have a feeling for how the environment worked out. Next, uh, we went to a, 
a system that was already in existence at, in South Dakota, that they had built a system. So we measured there how much noise this made at different locations and came up with a similar thing of being able to come up with an estimate of what that noise is from that particular um, plant in, in South Dakota. So then we married the two together and put, we, we put the system in here and be able to predict what was going on there. And when we did that, um, we get very close to the predicted levels that, that we needed. Let me see if I can get the right curve here. Um, so we, we were within a couple of dB of, of what, where it should be. And then uh, so that we could use this the uh, system as close. We're a little bit above. So then our, our, our colleague, uh, Tim Brungard, suggested if, to attenuate the sound a little bit more. So we came up with a system like this where the flow would go through these channels and there'd be absorption sound, absorbing material on both sides. It's sort of like a muffler, but we, we don't want to uh, impact the resistance too much. So we have this long, it's going to be about five feet long of flow through there with these panels to pick up this noise to get the, get the level down to this 55 dB level that we want to have. And so that's kind of, you know, the, the method we went through in order to, to, to figure this out. Okay, and that's that's it for me. So it's a pretty good. So, um, did you have? Did anybody have any questions? Yes. For the slender wing, um, was there any investigation into the stall characteristics of the wing at high angles of attack, cool. as you're as you're incurring the the laminar flow across the ring? I, I can't quite hear you. Can you speak up a little bit more? Let's try this again. How about that? Okay, for the slender wing design, um, the question is, was there any investigation into the stall characteristics of, of that wing, um, especially at high angles of attack? Yeah, that's, it's being looked at. Um, the stall, it actually, it has a pretty, let's put it this way, the, the lift coefficient is very significant. With the two foil design, if you look at the, the, the lift slope, it's pretty, it's pretty high. And so we don't anticipate being installed too much, but uh, it's, it's being looked at. I don't, I don't know, the, you know the details of it, but I know this is a very high lift to drag um, of airfoil. Okay. okay, is that a question for Mike Johnson? Uh, okay, so let's switch it, mics. Okay, so, um, so I'm... Uh, I'm going to be not being the group lead any longer in this department, so Mike, Mike Crane has graciously uh, agreed to do that uh, role. So uh, here's Mike. Won't you please welcome Mike? Uh, good afternoon. Okay, so <clears throat> um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, some work that we're doing, uh, funded by NSF, to look at uh, trailing edge noise mitigation. And... Uh, There we go. Okay, so this work is a joint effort by uh, us at uh, ARL and uh, Lehigh University. So the uh, student who did all the work at ARL is Zach Yost, who's now at Electric Boat. Um, student at Lehigh is uh, Huan Cheng Chen. <clears throat> so Lehigh is doing the theoretical end of things and we're doing the measurement end of things. So let's, we're talking about trailing edge noise, so let's define it first. So what happens is when you have any kind of lifting surface over which you develop a turbulent boundary layer, then you can get uh, trailing edge noise. So what causes trailing edge noise is the vortical eddies in the turbulent boundary layer, which are very small compared to the cord of the airfoil. The, every time each one goes over the edge, it generates a little impulsive force that generates sound. And the characteristics of that sound are like this. You've got uh, a sound power that scales like Mach number squared u to the third, where u is the flow speed, which is like u to the fifth then. Um, the sound directivity has this cardioid shape, okay, because of the baffling effect of the large airfoil. So when the airfoil is much larger than the wavelength of sound generated, you get this cardioid shape. <clears throat> this is the most efficient uh, source of noise on, on the lifting surface. So in your cooling fan, in your computer, what you're hearing mostly is trailing edge noise. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in aircraft on landing approach, this is also a, an important uh, noise source. 
So um, one, one clue as to how to make this quieter comes from the fact that owls are much quieter in flying than other birds. And some investigation by biologists have shown that the owls have uh, specialized plumage, which uh, the, the net effect of that specialized plumage is that their trailing edges are um, more porous and they're also more elastic than other birds. So the thought is that maybe this poroelastic trailing edge could reduce uh, trailing edge noise. So, <clears throat> um, right, so this, this is our, uh, this is the, the standard uh, uh, trailing edge for an impermeable uh, airfoil. And again, remember that the sound intensity scales like velocity to the fifth power. So some work, uh, and this was, this was all uh, discovered by uh, Fox Williams and Hall in the late uh, 60s. And then in the late 70s, early 80s, Leppington and Howe did some work where they showed that if, if you have a porous uh, uh, plate, then you, you turn from a, uh, your sound power then changes from, you get an additional factor of Mach number, which means you have U to the sixth uh, scaling, and then the uh, directivity becomes that of a dipole. So it, it effectively looks like your uh, porous, or your airfoil is, is, is um, uh, invisible to uh, the sound propagation. So, uh, and then some sub more subsequent work to that by Jaworski and Peake uh, in the last uh, 10 years, looked at what happens in between those two asymptotic limits. And on the left, you see the sound power uh, with the uh, exponent n, then varies uh, between five and six uh, rather smoothly. And this, is, this variation here is with this parameter mu over k, which is a uh, measure of the porosity of the plate. And that has to do with the uh, open area, which is that alpha, uh, and the uh, radius of the holes in the plate, okay? So you can see that the, uh, the exponent varies uh, smoothly with porosity. Uh, as the porosity increases, you go from the m, uh, u to the fifth uh, uh, impermeable uh, limit to the u to the sixth uh, porous limit. And similarly, for the, the uh, directivity, the green uh, and the black there shows the, uh, the impermeable limit, and the, uh, the, the red and the black here in, at the uh, other end of the uh, porosity limit shows the, the dipole. So what happens is as you increase porosity, you get a gradual, um, a gradual uh, transition to the dipole from the cardioid. So the question is, uh, what, what do we bring to the table on this? So uh, verifying this theory has been very difficult because uh, if you want to test it in either a flight test in a vehicle or in a wind tunnel, there are a lot of other noise sources present, uh, air acoustic noise sources that have similar character to the trailing edge noise. Um, and uh, when, when we in introduce porosity into the lifting surface, then this source is gonna go from the, the most efficient source to one of the least efficient sources. So we thought to uh, do an experiment where we abstracted the problem to the problem of one eddy going past the edge, and we do it in an anechoic chamber. And what we did is we uh, fired a vortex ring past an edge, okay? So, the, so instead of having a bunch of eddies going past, we just have one vortex ring, which has the same effect as a turbulent eddy. So we fire the vortex ring, it goes at speed u, we vary the speed u, and then we can measure uh, pressure, acoustic pressure, using uh, 12 microphones arrayed in a circle around the edge. And then, so we measure delta p. The delta p is the uh, amplitude of the waveform that we get in the acoustic field. We measure the uh, speed of the ring using uh, high-speed uh, Schlieren imaging of the ring. And then we can measure the directivity using the microphone array. So what did we get? Uh, well, first I should say we used diff four different uh, plates, so with different hole size and different open area, uh, which gives us on the bottom line there, you see the, the uh, porosity uh, values. So we go from the impermeable uh, limit to up here in the uh, high uh, uh, 10 to the one kind of range. That gives us uh, the uh, 
dipole limit. So our results look like this. The, uh, the uh, solid line there is the prediction for the uh, exponent of the sound power, and the measurements are uh, given by the symbols there for the different uh, porosity values. And you can see that the theory agrees pretty well with, the, uh, with that measurement. Okay, the, uh, the, uh, di the uh, directivity is a little more interesting. Um, you can see up uh, on, so what these are, these are directivities measured for the four different plates. You've got the symbols are the measurements and the, the, the lines are the uh, uh, theoretical predictions. And, uh, and this, the different colors just indicate different ring speeds. Um, so uh, we go from A to D, we, it, we're increasing uh, porosity. So A is the impermeable limit, and you can see the cardioid uh, pattern, everything is in nice agreement. Uh, once we switch to a slight bit of porosity, you see that uh, in contrast to the, the uh, prediction, the, uh, the directivity actually jumps to a, a pretty strong dipole, although you can see that it's a little bit uh, uh, skewed to the left, um, and uh, that trend continues until we, we end up with a, a, a complete dipole in the, in the high porosity case. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> so the most interesting thing of this was that the uh, was that the directivity snapped into a dipole shape a lot sooner than we expected. Okay, so um, uh, thus far what we've done is we've done an experimental, uh, ex we set up an experiment that would give us a clear uh, test of the theory. And we showed that the uh, sound power scaling laws and how they vary with porosity are pretty much confirmed. And the uh, predicted changes to directivity were qualitatively confirmed, but uh, they, they, they don't quite match the, the trend that we measured. Okay, so any questions uh, about that? All right, questions for Mike? Yeah, Mike. Yeah, hold on, wait for the mic. Uh, how exactly does the mechanism of the, you know, the owl wing chilling edge, why exactly does it make it a dipole shape? Like, kind of just the, what, what's the physics at play? Oh, are you just asking about the fundamental mechanism, or are you yeah, asking about Yeah, just like the... why, why does it do that, yeah. Okay, so the way I like to think of it is that, that the, uh, the, the, the large surface, okay, um, if you, when, when, a, when, a, when an eddy goes over the edge, it, it generates a force at the edge. Yeah. So that's like a dipole. So you should expect a dipole directivity, right? But you don't get that when the surface, large surface, impermeable surface is there because it baffles half of the dipole, okay? okay? And so you get this big uh, cardioid shape, right? As you increase the porosity in the plate, then the plate uh, allows the uh, sort of sloshing that you get in a, a normal dipole near the edge, and then that, that uh, gives you another uh, null in the, okay. in the directivity. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, my follow-up question is, why is u to the six better than u to the five? Wouldn't you want like u to the five? Right, so, so <clears throat> that's why, uh, right, I don't know if I can go back here. Right, so, right, so here's the, so you notice that it's uh, u to the fifth is the, Mach number is u divided by the speed of sound, right? Yeah. So you go from Mach number squared to Mach number in the next one, whoops, I'm going backwards, sorry. Mach number squared to Mach number to the third. And since Mach number is low in all these kind of situations, you know, that's, it's typically less than, you know, 0.1. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's where that comes from. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Okay. I had a question on the directivity scaling. I'm assuming those are scaled plots for the directivities? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So why is the scaling worse for uh, the porous <coughs> than it is for the um, 
not right. Those. So <clears throat> part of the issue there, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards. Part of the issue there is that, um, and, and I'll, on the way to that plot, I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Um, th these are our plates, right? So in order to get that ex exponent, we plotted, we plotted delta P versus ring speed, right? And the thing is, when you change the ring speed, you change the frequency of the sound. When you change the frequency of the sound, you change your mu over k. So each of our plates has a range of mu over k, okay? So that's part of what's going on there. So I'll, I'll just bring up that plot here so everybody sees what. So what, what Steve's talking about is the, the grouping are, are pretty tight in the impermeable plate, but as you go higher and higher porosity, they seem to uh, get, uh, the, the scatter gets higher. And uh, we haven't sorted that out yet. So, but yeah, this is just a simple scaling with uh, the sound power to get it to, to one. Uh, Okay, so thanks again. Before we um, uh, say goodbye to the flow folks, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Johnson for his uh, work over the years. He's been a group head uh, for the flow deuce noise group for quite a while. Uh, always been loyal, always uh, beat the bushes for uh, highlights every CV workshop, found good speakers for the uh, seminar series. So um, we'll miss Mike, but I'm sure he'll remain part of the group. And uh, we welcome uh, Mike Crane, who I'm sure will do an equally good job. So thanks, thanks to Mike Johnson. Let's give him a round of applause.